Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading video for Monday, August 21st, uh, 2023. I am off my game this month. I like to post these videos around Friday or Saturday, but you know, uh, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Not that that's really great for the channel to just, you know, be all willy-nilly about uh, when to expect things on here, but uh, the important thing is to keep on reading and keep on trucking by, I suppose. Uh, and I'm glad to still have my head in the game and have some things to share with you today. And the first thing I'll share, as always, is the next story in the current anthology I'm reading, uh, the current one being Oi Karumba, an anthology of Jewish stories from Latin America, edited by Elan Stavins. We are officially reaching the end of this anthology. Uh, I have gotten into an appendix of short stories written by one person, the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges. And uh, the story I read uh, this week is called Emma Zuns. <laughs> Uh, and it is a story that uh, is obliquely Jewish, uh, mostly uh, through uh, last names is uh, my association. I think s other parts of it uh, come from if you have uh, knowledge of the geography that's being talked about in this story, but uh, Zunz is a Yiddish name and another big name that comes into play is a Lowenthal, which technically I think is Germanic, uh, but uh, a lot of the uh, influential people who are uh, Lowenthals are Jewish. Uh, and anyway, the story begins when Emma gets uh, notice that her father has died. He was uh, imprisoned in Brazil uh, for an embezzling scheme, and she is positive he committed suicide. She's positive that he was wrongfully accused, and uh, that the now owner of uh, her textile mill where she works, uh, a man named Lowenthal, was actually responsible. So in this narrative, she sets out to take revenge. Uh, and so what she does is uh, she uh, enters into a sexual liaison where she uh, prostitutes herself. Uh, and then uh, she, uh, or maybe before this, she technically calls Lowenthal to say she has information on a strike. Uh, and when they get to meet together, go to meet together, and he turns to get some water or something, she shoots him in revenge and then claims he'd been abusing her, which uh, then uh, is a harrowing way to tie back in the fact that she had sexual congress with people to, uh, you know, uh, instigate that he'd uh, uh, molested her. So it's a story filled with cynicism and revenge. It's also straight up uh, narrative. Uh, passive reporting voice about then Emma did this, then Emma did that, no dialogue or anything like that. It's not my favorite way to get into story. I'm wondering if Borges's other uh, couple of stories in here are going to be the same. I guess I'll see in coming weeks, but it's definitely a very chilling uh, premise. And the first novel I finished this week is Take What You Need by Idra Novi. This I put on my mock reads list for contemporary fiction. Uh, basically, I make myself a TBR of uh, current releases, uh, 2023 releases in this case, of uh, books in varying genres I want to read before the Goodreads Choice Awards. Uh, not that I'm assuming this one will make it onto that list, but you know, I have my own tastes in fiction, or at least I try to or think I do. Uh, I, I read another one of Novi's books a few years ago, and uh, the premise of this one sounded intriguing, but I, uh, I had trouble with it. I'm having trouble at this, uh, you know, with my first few books I've talked about in my August damn reading videos. I don't know. It's, uh, anyway, I'll get into it. <laughs> this is a uh, dual narrative and uh, I guess technically dual timeline narrative. Uh, we're following um, a, a stepmother and stepdaughter, although they haven't technically been related in that way for several decades, but, you know, they have these formative memories together when the stepdaughter Leah was a young girl, but then Jean got tired of uh, Leah's, uh, you know, uh, corralling, uh, like, uh, patronizing father, and she left, and uh, the father in revenge basically refused uh, that they could have any contact as Leah continued to grow up. And then when Leah tried to uh, make contact again, she found uh, Jean to be uh, kind of standoffish and how weird she was. And uh, also uh, there's a lot of commentary in here about like, I guess, uh, 
coastal liberal values versus Rust Belt values. And uh, a lot of the story takes place uh, during the Trump administration when the country, when the US is becoming more and more polarized based on that geography. And so what I was assuming was this, that this, uh, you know, and maybe it's wrong to go in and judge books based on incorrect assumptions, but I went into it thinking that this would be about Leah going to visit her stepmother for the first time in several years and having to contend with like political differences and where they're the same and where they converge and, you know, having to deal with uh, the uh, environs of this uh, rural uh, town and and that part i guess is the most true the, the part that's least true is that they actually meet up <laughs> because in leah's storyline she's heard from her uh from jean's uh, housemate that jean has died and she's going to the house to sort of deal with jean's uh, weird crazy sculpture just called manglements and she has her uh latinx husband and uh, her uh, mixed race son in the car with her and then in the next storyline, it's uh, Jean's basically final years, uh, where uh, it talks about how she meets this housemaid. It talks about her manglements and about uh, what she's trying to do as, you know, a uh, woman and creator of art and what this says about her life. Uh, and also there's a lot of commentary in both about her uh, rustic uh, hometown and how it's... Uh, becoming rightward leaning and why and and anyway uh so yeah it's disjointed uh and uh again the narrative style didn't work for me because it was very first person people sort of it, like it felt a lot like uh i want to say a radio drama and that's probably because it worked better for me in audio i read the whole thing uh uh, physically, uh, and it was just harder for me to connect to the language, and there were no quotation marks, and that annoyed me. And then when I listened to it, it was like uh, maybe it's maybe I'm saying it's like a play, like a one woman or two woman play, where you know the women are on the stage giving their monologues and like inflecting. And then I was far more intrigued. Uh, so I'm not sure what that necessarily says about the writing. You know, we like to say, and I mean I interchange a lot between, you know, if I'm listening to an audiobook versus listening to a physical, reading a physical book. Often I uh, go to audiobooks for fiction, for uh, nonfiction and science fiction fantasy, uh, especially, I started with science fiction fantasy, especially because, you know, they're plot pl more plotty, and I figured that would make, uh, you know, uh, listening to them more compelling, and I te technically don't listen to as much uh, literary fiction because I kind of uh, want to dive more into the language and see it for myself and sort of swim in it myself. But in this case, the narrative structure really lent itself, I think, to listening to it as though it's like a monologue in a play. So I think that's just interesting to think about. Uh, and I guess in terms of judging art, you know, you just judge it how you come to it, I guess. And so now I have these two sort of, speaking of two dual timelines, juxtaposition, disparate, I have like these two feelings about it. And the first one, it's like, I had trouble connecting. And I connected more to Leah, I guess, because Leah was much more familiar to me as a coastal elite. And, you know, I could like easily get into her head, like when she's at the gas station, and some, you know, white racist woman is like heckling her husband and like, you know, lecturing him as though being Latinx is, you know, anti American or something. And, uh, Leah's like uh, defensive response to you know being the white woman married to uh, a Latinx man coming but coming back to her hometown where she you know has all these horrible mixed feelings I guess you know that's you know I feel like I could connect to that more almost like it, it, it's a, in a way it's a simpler story where the good guys and bad guys are more delineated and it took to getting to the audiobook for me to connect more to Jean and realize how complicated her story is really that she's this sort of uh, brash loner woman uh, who's living in this uh, town where um, for the most part I think she uh, feels more and more alienated. She's alienated by the uh, poverty and the growing violence uh, it's of the young unemployed men. She doesn't, you know, she hates Trump, although I don't think she has a lot of uh, warm feelings about most politicians in D.C. either that she, you know, no, but like she has a line about, you know, no matter who's in that house, you know, it hasn't done much for, you know, my county. Uh, and she has backstory about how she's been, you know, physically and mentally abused by her father and then, you know, 
demeaned by her husband and she just you know is sort of done with society in ways and like a lot of what she's doing in her later life after she's laid off from a hospital that closed down is she uses uh, these manglements in this art and this uh, which is basically she uses scrap metal and YouTube videos to weld things and uh, it's about her trying to sort of claim an identity for herself and there's a lot of uh, you know um, references to uh, artists and her art forms subscription from college and that sort of thing and it really seems like what she's trying to do is sort of uh, you know uh, inculcate this identity where she feels so ostracized and alone and certainly she is uh, sad that her relationship with uh, Leah went off the rails that they didn't have the formative years together and then I think Jean's personality was just too brash and weird for Leah to connect to in her uh, later years starting in college where she wanted a more traditional maternal figure that she didn't get. So uh, yeah, and then, you know, on top of that, I haven't even gotten to this relationship with an angry young man named Elliot that Jean uh, forms. And I think that makes her a little more sympathetic to uh, at least uh, Elliot's, uh, you know, uh, issues with uh, this past arrest he had where he can't find a job and uh, part of the reason she and Elliot even meet is because his family is using her spigot for water uh, because their water's been turned off and they live in this really dilapidated rental uh, and so uh, Jean is one of the only few uh, homeowners in the area and she you know uh, utters the titular take what you need as in take the water and that's how they meet uh, and then he helps her along with uh, the artwork and then Leah has a very different uh, association with Elliot. Uh, she actually met him uh, the last time she and Jean saw each other and they had a hard falling out and uh, Leah accused her of you know budding up, bu uh, buddying up with uh, white supremacists because they were hanging out with uh, Elliot and his uh, friends and uh, the friends were pretty creepy in uh, uh, Leah's telling and I think Jean kind of comes to that association later so I don't know, you know, I get that it's kind of like a novel of ideas. I feel like, I don't know, the the artwork part is the most fascinating part, or, you know, Jean also has mixed heritage. She, her mother was Jewish and her father was anti-Semitic about her mother's family, although that doesn't say much about uh, the family. <laughs> I don't know, my feelings are kind of all over the place. I feel like these are vignettes and maybe there's a, it's difficult to kind of grasp onto some things except for the sort of uh, unnerving feeling of uh, polarization and uh, danger and uh, lost chances and that sort of thing, but it's not like a more complicated uh, character study, I think, than just a quick flyover, as it were. Uh, and uh, the narrative style could make it difficult to read, uh, but, it would be interesting, maybe, if this were adapted to a screenplay. Who knows? <laughs> the next book I just started was my page 112 pick for the month. This is The Forever Summer by Jamie Brenner. Uh, and it feels very different, you know, the title and everything feels like this is going to be a much easier, breezier sort of read. But I'm in very early days. I've read the prologue and, like, the first couple of paragraphs. Uh, I think it's, like, the first... Uh, uh, chapter and a half. I was like uh, starting to read it, waiting for some friends for brunch earlier this weekend. <laughs> anyway, uh, and uh, so far everything feels a little disconnected. The prologue is in completely disconnected from these uh, first couple of uh, chapters where a uh, young woman in New York uh, announces to her parents that uh, she broke off her engagement abruptly and then she secretly um, you know, uh, admitting to herself that she did it because she felt such an intense physical attraction to a man at work. So we'll see how that goes. And then it also seems like her parents are hiding some big bag secret that I guess we'll come back to later. And that's where I am right now. So no idea how this, uh, you know, disjointed prologue that has nothing to do with these characters so far fits into it. Uh, but uh, I should be finishing this uh, book this week and I will be reporting back. And the final book I have to talk about, uh, going back to audio, is Foster by Claire Keegan. This is a novella, really, very short book, uh, that uh, takes place in rural Ireland, where a young girl is placed in the care of some uh, family members living on a farm over a summer, I believe, and uh, that's all I should say about it anyway, because I am reading this book for the Booktube Prize. 
So the BookTube Prize was started by Robert at Barter Hordes for the literary internet community, mostly on BookTube. Uh, and uh, the point is to uh, read the best of literary fiction and nonfiction published in the US the year before. So this year we're reading 2022 releases. And we are in the final round where we're dealing with the finals ballots for fiction and nonfiction. I am reading for fiction in the finals. I have a ballot of six books, including Foster. I have to read them and keep my thoughts to myself until I submit my ballot of uh, my favorite to least favorite books. And then in October, we will uh, hear uh, aggregated, all of the judges' uh, opinions will be aggregated and we'll hear which books win the top three spots per division. And I've been a judge uh, officially for a few years now, and it's just been a great way for me to, uh, you know, expand my reading and do something really fun with the rest of the community. Uh, and I did, you know, leave some preliminary thoughts on my ballot. We're not supposed to talk about, you know, our thoughts as we read and influence each other, but I had some preliminary thoughts before I started reading. So if you'd uh, be interested in those, I'll leave that video linked down below. And that about covers it for me now, getting into a new week of August, and I have a lot more reading I'd love to get to, but uh, at the end of the week I also have some uh, fun stuff hopefully uh, going on. Uh, my uh, niece and nephew are about to uh, start school again. Uh, my niece will be in fourth grade and my nephew's starting kindergarten. And uh, on Friday, hopefully, uh, my dad will be bringing them to uh, DC. Uh, I live in the DC area and we will hopefully go to the zoo if the weather cooperates or maybe to one of the museums if it doesn't. It's been kind of hot here lately, uh, but I have to go ahead and ask my boss for some time off work so I get to spend that time with them and I'm excited. It's it's going to be my nephew's uh, first uh, visit to DC, so, so that's exciting in and of itself. Uh, and yeah, it's nice to have something like that to look forward to. I hope you all have uh, things to look forward to as well in reading and otherwise. I should be back on this channel in the next couple of days, speaking of mock reads videos, to do my uh, 2023 science fiction list of books I'm hoping to complete before the Goodreads Choice Awards uh, in a couple of months, so stay tuned for that. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.